Hello, welcome to the Classical Top 5. I'm Tommy Pearson and with me are Fiona Maddox and Richard Bratby, as always, poised this week to choose their top five operas of the 20th century. Now, it's tempting to think that that refers only to modern contemporary music operas, but let's remember that great operatic composers like Richard Strauss and Puccini were writing in the 20th century. So there's a huge choice. And once again, we've set ourselves an impossible task. But to help us through it, we have a very special guest, a director and librettist who has been responsible for some of the finest operas of the latter half of the 20th century and beyond, and whose work is bound to feature on anyone's top five list. It's Peter Sellers, who's joining us from California. Peter, thank you so much for joining us. Um, how's lockdown been for you? How's this whole virus situation been for you? Actually, it's amazing to have time, which is the one thing we were all running around like crazy and not really focused deeply enough on anything. And of course, the virus has been our teacher. And, uh, and the presence of life and death actually makes you realize, wait a minute, what is important in our lives? Let's actually go towards that and let's let the rest go. Yes. And uh, so have you, have you been working or have you been doing a lot of thinking in this time? Thinking, reading, going through scores, you know, getting really going deeply, uh, which has just been amazing. And, uh, and, and yes, cooking, cooking stuff for, for the future, because obviously the whole point of the future is it's not going to look like the past. And so let's go for it. <laughs> yes. I mean, we, we, we'll talk about that a little bit later, but I, I was thinking of you, uh, one, one of the things, of course, we, none of us have really been able to do much is human contact. You're, you're one of the world's great huggers. How have you managed without hugging everyone? You know, satellite hugs are not illegal. <laughs> so I'm, I'm reaching out to you now, Tommy. <laughs> oh, lovely. Oh, well, that's very nice. <laughs> and your mom. <laughs> Thank you. Yeah, she will be thrilled to hear that. Okay, so Peter, we, we set you this impossible task of choosing five operas from the 20th century. Uh, how did you go about choosing them? Okay, well, you know, uh, I mean, greatness means a lot of things, but I just didn't want it to mean uh, the statues that everybody's pulling over and throwing in the dumping in the harbor. So I thought, let, let's have another idea of greatness. So for me, I actually thought, what are the operas that are planted the seeds that are leading to what we'll do next? And what are the operas that we're looking to, we're still looking to, to, to inspire us to the next place we all have to go? And, 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 so, and also, what are the operas that really faced head on the urgent issues of the 20th century? You know, and so that means I, I took away a bunch of operas that for me are magnificent, but also are the end of the line of where they were going. And I said, well, let's, let's look at the operas that actually are still waiting to be in some way uh, part of a conversation. Okay, well, let's dive straight in then. What's your first choice? This is too obvious. And uh, they're all operas that I've worked on uh, and in London with, with, with Esapekka uh, Salonen and, and Simon Rattle. But of course, uh, Peleus and Melisande was just the opera that broke through and created a, a future and just said, excuse me, uh, opera should have people speaking in, their, in, in normal speech rhythms. It should move inside and outside. It should be mysterious. It should tell stories in elliptical ways that open us into other worlds. And, and you know, it, it just launched the 20th century entirely. Well, and I, I see hands going up here. I'm assuming, Fiona, you, this is one of your choices too. Yes, you, you assume correctly. Um, <laughs> it was the first one I wrote down and uh, I just had to check. It was just into the 20th century, um, it, which it is. And, uh, or two, we're just... <laughs> yes. Yeah. And um, I, I think it, it remains, however many times you encounter it, it remains a magnificent mystery. It's, it's, there's so many questions that remain unanswered in it about just what it's about and, and the nature of the, the writing, the text and, and Debussy's score um, it insists that it remains a mystery, but that's why I think it, it goes on being something that we come back to again and again. Because, I mean, you, uh, you go to the opera, or, or did up until this, this whole situation, Fiona, an awful lot. What, what is it that you, are you looking for? Because presumably you've seen a lot of these operas more than once and in different productions. So what is it that you, you look for in a piece like Pelias, for example? What are you looking for in a production of, of that? Or do you want to be surprised? 
I don't know that I'm looking for anything. I think I'm waiting to see what it brings to me. Um, I've, I've been to productions where there's, there are, there are um, lakes and waterfalls and, and very realistic sort of things. And I've been to one that was set entirely in the interior of a house, suggesting the interior of the mind. Um, both were completely enthralling and beguiling. I've also been to some which were not enthralling, um, <laughs> but I suppose we've all had that experience. Yes. But the music always is, I have to say hastily. And Richard, this was one of yours too. I think so. I mean, uh, yeah, well, what, what, why, why do we need art? Why do we need opera? Why do we need to sort of put together all these weird things in one place, music, drama, the visuals, the language? Um, and here with Pelias, you have the perfect answer to that. It gives you something that can't be said or done in any other way. It's something that you, you understand when you see it. It's been absolute human truth to be conveying things that are deeply meaningful, deeply real. Um, you know, all the beauty of the thing, it's incredibly raw and it's incredibly direct in its appeal to you. And, and yet you can't put it into words you can't it's almost critic proof um it, it it's it's it you know you know it you know you experience something that's deeply truthful deeply important and you cannot you can't there's no way of saying it you just have to experience it so that that's the case with you is it peter that, that if you have something that you view that perfect you leave that and you concentrate on what you need to do with your vision I spent 30 years of my life on that piece. When I first did it, I did it coming out of the LA uprising with the city on fire and Peleos answered it. You know, it's Peleos responds in any situation and it shows you the end of the 19th century, the end of the empire, the sadness and weirdness of the old money and the old power. And at the same time, it is this, uh, it's this hope, this fragile hope that, you know, you, you end the opera with an 80 year old man holding a baby and the three generations in between just kill, destroy. And you say, what is the hope for this very fragile future? It's very moving, it's overwhelming. And of course, the human dimension of it uh, has this spiritual imminence constantly. And Debussy's music just takes you into the interior, you know, uh, as Fiona said so beautifully. And, and I, that I think is the gift of opera, is it, it is, simultaneously it gives you the outer world but it also says excuse me what's moving everything is coming from inside and that's really tremendous i i just one last word on it is it just i think that there's almost no other opera i can think of that so brilliantly conveys our desire to understand that which we can never understand and that's the inside of the, the thoughts and the what's going on with somebody when we're not with them. It's a, it's a, it's a terrible, um, shocking feeling that you, you, you just, that, that Debussy presents so brilliantly, the anxieties between all the characters. Um, I, I, I find it heartbreaking. <laughs> I, I'm not in an emotional wishy-washy way at all, but in a head and heart way. Is there a production you can think of that w really captured it best for you? Uh, well, I, I'm just thinking of the most recent one I went to, which was a Scottish opera one, which which was quite naturalistic, but it, it was a an interior exterior setting, and it it was it was very was very direct and not it didn't inter it didn't over interpret it, but it guided you through what can sometimes be too mysterious, but uh, too mysterious in productions that don't work. So we've, we've had agreement all around there. So let's have a, a new one from Richard next. Richard, oh, how, right. did you, how did you approach this, this top five operas? In um, well, I was partly trying to second guess everybody else and avoid <laughs> the obvious. And also, um, just, I, I just thought, you know, I'm just going to go with the ones I, I, I feel enthused and um, personally feel keen about talking about. I, I thought I'd go with something completely um, a bit mischievous, maybe counterintuitive here, but you know, the most successful music drama of the 20th century, certainly the first half of the 20th century, that set the course for an entire genre up to the present day. Um, it's got to be The Merry Widow by Franz yeah. Lehár. Um, <laughs> there you are. Um, it's, um, we all think we know what it is. I mean, it's, it, it's a piece of escapist entertainment. It can be done rather more subtly than that. I have seen it done more subtly than that. Um, but it's ultimately with comic opera, you don't want to bring out the shadows too deeply. It's just getting it just right. And, you know, the inspiration is never fresher. Um, the thing itself is thrown together um, at the very end 
the very end of the year in Vienna, they just, it was kind of, I think he was auditioned over the telephone to write the score for it. Uh, they turned it out. The management said, this is useless, but we've got a slot at the end of the year. We'll stick it on anyway with some second hand sets. And two years later, the thing has gone around the world and started an industry. And if there's a, you know, that's, that's the course of commercial musical theatre from the 20th century set. It's the first great global musical smash. And, you know, the melodies and the ideas, the entertainment, the pacing, um, the, the humour are all strong enough for even now to stand up. Um, so it's not, I wouldn't say it's, it's you know it's not your, it's not giving you much of transcendence it's not giving you much of answers to major life problems it is giving you two hours of extremely enjoyable entertainment and extremely um you know e- e- extreme amusement and melody um i mean i'm a big fan of, of operetta as a genre anyway i mean it's it's not true that lehar just kept repeating that success he did actually develop it in quite interesting in different ways uh, later in his life but this is a one work that you just can't get past really you know define the genre defined a course of like music and i looked at opera based statistics i think it's still in the top 20 most performed operas in the world in 2019 and the year before that um after puccini um lehar and his colleague kalman are the most performed 20th century opera composers um, i mean the okay. um, berg janacek britain don't even come remotely close to the kind of performances these guys are still getting uh, which must say something i guess why do you think comic opera isn't taken more seriously then <laughs> well, it's um, it, it's it's hard to get the funny stuff right, isn't it? You know, and it's and it's hard to believe that it's saying anything important. People don't like to think that sort of silly stuff is saying telling us anything fundamental or important. Like, I think, and if you start thinking that way, you sort of produce a production that's you get a production that's too heavy-handed, too lead, and it doesn't really do what it needs to do. It doesn't hit the right beats. But I, I have seen productions where you sort of just need to have just a touch of a hint of shadow, just a little touch of humanity, I and mean, these rather silly, rather rather stereotypical characters just enough to suggest that there's something going on beneath the surface and the music does the rest um and of course there's also the problem of spoken dialogue which um uh, has to be translated adapted and um, rethought for every production which is what lehar and his librettists would have expected and not enough people really um address creatively enough have you done any comic opera peter Oh, yeah, a lot. Uh, I mean, you know, the Grand Macabre, of course, is, uh, is oh, the well, classic, yeah. you know, absurdity. <laughs> but, but I have to say, for me, uh, I couldn't agree more, Richard. I mean, I, I, I mean, I didn't pick it, of course, but, you know, th- for me, it's one of the greatest operas ever written. And, and I would also say it is actually deep and haunting and beautiful. And I don't know if you know the silent movie made by Eric von Stroheim. You know, at the end of the 20s, it's one of the darkest, weirdest, most incredible sense that the Ancien Regime, again, is, is like Debussy. It's finished. The widow, it's not a, it's, it's a real image, right? It, 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 she's looking for a new era. It's, it has to begin again in some new way. And, and you, 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 the, the past is finished. And I have to say, I find the piece so haunting and so moving and, and actually, you know, can be played as Stroheim does, absolutely seriously. So the, I, I would even switch a little bit your, your, uh, your impulse, which is just to say, you can also play it very seriously. And what is the light are the comic touches. Because I think in opera, what always happens is the comic touches are too obvious. And, and you want to say, please, just calm down, back, back off. First, make these real people in a real situation. Let's feel the tension and the power and the dynamics. And then let's have this delicate humor because, excuse me, people are inherently funny. And as human beings, we have to laugh at ourselves, please. You know, but not make the whole thing a ridiculous you know, slapstick, but the opposite. is like in the darkest and most intense moment, suddenly there's this strange humor and you go, what? And of course, that is life. Yeah. Oh, I'm so I'm so pleased you you did you picked a comic opera, though, uh, Richard. I, I I had you down as doing doing so because I know you were always very keen to make sure <laughs> that people do take it seriously. Being funny is a very serious business, and I think it yeah. shows us something about, about humanity, about it can, it, and even something as frivolous. I, I, like I say, the the most recent English national opera staging um, of the widow um, had had a one quintet set to you know it was a line of blokes just urinating out into the public. Um, and they kept doing bad jokes about gold beavers for some reason. I never really got what that was about. But more, another production I saw at Opera North, um, I can't forget who the director was, but it's been revived a few times. And it just suggests that Danny Liu and Hannah genuinely loved each other. There was actual heartbreak behind there. And again, it's, it's about new money coming to an old world, about the absurdity of the old world, and also its charm, um, and sort of the brashness of the new money, but also its vitality. 
um, and there's a story for you for the 20th century. Okay, let's move on. Fiona, a choice from you. Um, well, I think I'll go to the extreme opposite of Richard. I, I suppose I was thinking slightly chronologically here rather than necessarily that I don't have a, a number one. Um, and it does only have it, two characters on the stage and it is Bluebeard's Castle. Uh, I think humanly it's a, a very intense drama. It's, it's got a lot of truths in it about human relationships, but the score is quite dazzling. And I wish Bartok had written more opera because I, I do think it's, it's just jaw dropping. I don't know whether anybody else mm. has any feelings about it, but each door that Judith, 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 the wife, new wife comes to, Bartok conjures such extraordinary colours and darkness and dazzle and gleam and it's 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 a it really absolutely gets you every time or gets me every time I I I'll travel a long way to go to Bluebeard's Castle. I've never I've never seen a, a fully staged version I've seen semi-staged versions yep. in concert halls where where of course the music is way more up front um, and and, and it's such a different experience, opera, when, when it's done like that, I think. I saw the uh, Stockhaus and Donnerstag auch liegt, though when they did it at um, the Royal Festival Hall, suddenly the music is front and centre and it becomes a completely different being, doesn't it? You can well. do it with, 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 with very little staging um, mm. because the orchestra is, is the drama in a yes. very particular way. I, I went to it at um, Leeds Town Hall last year, year before, and it was as good as anything I've seen fully staged in an opera house. That's not, not the reason I chose it because it's a compact opera because it does need quite a big orchestra. So it's, it was, there was no lockdown intention in <laughs> choosing it, but um, uh, just, just I, I, love, I love it. Yes, I assumed it would be on someone's list. Um, Bartok for you, Peter? Well, I mean, it's one of the most spectacular pieces ever written. I've never staged it exactly because, as you said, the orchestra handles it. I mean, my God, anything you're going to add to it? Are you kidding? You, how do you match the imagery from that orchestra? I mean, Bartok clearly just says, excuse me, I'm the greatest living composer. Shut up. You know, it's like it's like Mozart did now. It just explodes the categories. And it just like it, it just puts everyone else in the dust. And, 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 and Bartok then, as you said, I'm so sorry he never went into an opera house. But I also think he he his mind is totally in that orchestra and so in a way you know he explodes the notion of of the, the of the field of opera uh he says you can add nothing to this it's so cosmic and overwhelming but uh yes we love it so dearly and and it's it's one of the great moments and in any century my god Ugh. um one of my choices uh talking of overwhelming uh has to be lady macbeth and Stensk by shostakovich um, it annoys me intensely that he wrote it when he was 28. I sit here 20 years after that thinking, what have I ever done? I mean, uh, it's just such an extraordinary experience for such a, well, I mean, Shostakovich just generally is an extraordinary experience for, for someone of, of whatever age it was when he wrote whatever piece you're talking about. But um, I went to see, a, I've seen a few productions of it. I went to see the Richard Jones production, which became quite celebrated actually at the Opera House. And I see, saw that a couple of times, it's absolutely knocked out by it. I've always been a fan of the, of the um, interludes, the musical interludes of, of the opera as well, which I knew before I'd seen the whole thing. And there's one in particular that follows the, the discovery of the body in, in this production in, in a freezer. And uh, it, it, it requires a, a, a pretty much a full brass band coming onto the stage. And the way Jones had, had staged it, was so exciting and it's such an extraordinary moment anyway, a big burst of energy in this and very Shostakovich rhythmic march like music. It was so exciting. I was sitting in a box. I was lucky to have a, have a box. I was in one of those highest, one of those stools you have to sit on when you're on the second row. So you can see over the people who are in front of you. And I lit, I've never done it before. I leapt out of it. I was so excited because it was it just an extraordinary moment. And of course, the whole thing is so overwhelming. I mean, there aren't an enormous number of gags in it, but uh, what a story, what an experience, and what an extraordinary way to approach music, I think, dramatically. I mean, he clearly from a very early age playing the piano uh, for films, and he was a brilliant film composer. He understood drama 
brilliantly and how to score it essentially. And actually it struck me, strikes me every time I see the opera, how much like film music it, it is in the way in which he scores the opera uh, with the action. It, it really resonates there, I think. And uh, yeah, I think it's, a, it, it's just an extraordinary experience and you walk out of that opera house just knocked out by the whole experience, uh, moved, um, excited, all, all the emotions in one go. I mean, what more could you want, really? Anybody got anything to add for Shostakovich? Fiona? Well, it's, it's one of my choices. Um, I think the portrayal of Lady Macbeth of Mzensk, the, the central figure, she's a, she's a, she's a, a bored Russian housewife <laughs> uh, who decides to do some quite villainous things. And it, it's really no holds barred. It's a hideous story. Yes. Hideous. <laughs> and it doesn't really put the case for not just women, anybody. <laughs> too well, actually. <laughs> I think that's probably why I really like it. <laughs> yes. Not yes. a huge number of likeable characters in it. Yes, but it, it, I, I think it has got wit in it. I think it's got a huge <laughs> amount. Of, I mean, uh, any woman who can poison the father-in-law with um with his mushroom risotto or whatever it is she poison i think of it every time i make mushroom risotto <laughs> <laughs> my husband's quite lucky he's still alive actually <laughs> that's gracious yes peter well no, no, just no, to no. Say, that was uh, a joke that was a joke <laughs> no. okay, all right that was a joke. Uh, <laughs> we, believe, we believe you we believe you yeah, yeah. Um, uh, just to say, uh, I mean, absolutely, I, what I just to whisper, I didn't put it on my list, but it's also because I have my eye on the revision of it in the, in the later 50s, which is way less crazy, but at the same time, Shostakovich, the mature Shostakovich, the intensity and the interiority of Katerina Ismailova is actually really something. And so uh, that's, that's something I actually do have my eye on. Okay. Well, let's go to your second choice, Peter. Well, kind of, you know, matching Fiona in a way and, 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 and Richard in a way, uh, but slightly differently, is uh, Hindemith Mathis der Mahler. Uh, I, just for me, 1935, uh, you know, under house arrest in, in Nazi Germany. Uh, you know, again, what does it mean that we are constantly confronting fascism? The 20th century brought fascism right into the world's vocabulary and this kind of viral energy of fascism and how do you address it? How do you confront it? What does it mean for Hindemith to write, you know, as Pasternak wrote Dr. Zhivago as a personal letter to Stalin? You know, Hindemith really was writing this opera for Hitler and trying to say, stop, you don't know where you're taking our country and the world. And it, it, for me, one of the most incredible things is when opera can address the leadership, you know, that powerfully, because Stalin was at the opera every night. And, uh, and, and, and again, this idea that you do have the king's box, the queen's box, you are talking to a power structure. What is the possibility of opera to address where the country is going? And so for me, Mathis de Mahler is one of the most heartrending and powerful pieces with Hindemith drawing on the entire history of German opera. There's Wagner in there, there's Palestrina in there, there's the entire history of German music is brought forward and said, this is who we are. Now, where are we going? Please, please stop. Let's look, let's, let's open some space together where we can really talk honestly and openly. And for an opera that takes on the burning of books, the gassing of the peasants. I mean, it, it is, it's really unbelievably courageous. And, uh, and uh, that kind of courage is, is one of the great, great things in the history of opera. I mean, it leads me to ask you about now. One of the, one of the uh, big concerns with, with lockdown, as far as classical music was concerned, with, with um, what's happening is the composers are perhaps not being commissioned uh, right now because people just simply can't afford to, to take on big big commissions at the moment, uh, we, which means we may lose the composers commenting in music about now, what they're facing now, not just with the virus, but of course in, in America and, and around the world, these leaders that we, that we have that people want to, to react to. I mean, particularly in America, you know, I'm dying to know whether John Adams is writing a Trump opera you know, it, it, someone's got to do something. There's, there's no human interest in the topic. <laughs> <laughs> okay, no, good point. But I do think ultimately maybe a little, you know, in a, 
uh, 10 years, it, there's a Boris Goudinoff element. But, but just, to say, just to say really also what, I mean, composers have lived in lockdown since day one. Um, you know, they go into room alone and they make something. But also I think what's marvelous is opera now is being invented by a new generation, not in the image of the monster opera house and the massive resources, but in the Monteverdi, you know, uh, uh, sense that a handful of people can create an unforgettable experience that reaches right into the heart of the political world as in Popea, but also creates a world of fantasy and opening and moving between life and death as in Orfeo. I mean, to me, the early opera now suddenly speaks and the new operas that are being written are a reflection of this intimacy that people are looking for instead of this corporate statement. Well, I mean, this is certainly the case, Richard, isn't it, with, with the great operas is that they speak for, for all time in their subjects and the way they approach it. I think, well, yes, I mean, and endlessly, um, you know, endlessly interpretable. But I mean, I'm interested by what Peter says, particularly about the, um, here we are talking about 20th century opera. Um, he's what he says about early music. Um, I mean, I, I was, I came late to Monteverdi. Um, the first thing that was astonishing was this is more like Wagner than anything else I could think of. The fluidity, the swiftness, the directness of it get, sort of it moves on its feet. It, twi it sort of takes some human emotions, examines them, throws them aside comes back, re-examines them. Um, it was so urgent and so lively and so fluid, unlike, unlike say, what came afterwards in the Baroque era. Um, and it just seems so, so, so now, so documentary almost. Um, and I'm, I'm fascinated to hear that sort of parallel. And um, yeah, an opera that can do that. I mean, I, I, th there has to be this sort of... Um, Peter said something um, once which has always stuck with me, which was that, um, it, you know, theatre is about creating a space that does not exist um, anywhere else in society um, to discuss things and I think that's certainly what Monteverdi does there and it's um, I mean from his description of Matisse de Mahler I mean it's, it's an opera I've, I've never seen so I don't think it's been staged in the UK in, in the time I've been in the music in the music business in the last 20 years um, or going to operas um, I, I would go a long way to hear it so I'm fascinating to hear what you know the, the what he says about it there. Just, just wondering why it is so difficult to get to, to get it staged. It doesn't seem to be on anybody's lists in general terms. Well, you know, we did it, we did it at Covent Garden uh, with Especa years ago, but again, I mean, the orchestra was in between Aida and Swan Lake, and so Especa would give the downbeat of the brass, would just look at him and say, really? <laughs> you, you really want us to do this? I mean, it's a monster. It is proto-Wagnerian, and the, the, the sheer, the chorus, you know, need, need, need these unbelievable deep you know split choruses with you know renaissance polyphony it is extremely hard the male role of Mathis is the longest uh baritone role in the history of opera you know and there's some stiff competition right it makes Gernemans look like you know La Sera Padrona it's really it's just it's it's a monster of a piece and and it just to pull off the sheer resources of it and of course, unlike the Wagner operas, which most people know how to play, so you can kind of put them together, this you've got to rehearse it from day one. It's unfamiliar, and you have to really work on the detail because Hindemith is absolutely nothing goes by that you don't say, wait a minute, what was that? You know, and so it needs to be rehearsed within an inch of its life. And that's, that's seriously demanding these days. Fiona, let's go to you for another choice. Hmm. Um, um, moving forward a bit in time, I, I, I have to put Peter Grimes, um, 1948. Um, I, I'm not going to subscribe to the first British Opera View, but it is pretty much one of the first that has absolutely reached um, a, a, a much wider audience. And it's very clear why, because it's the, the music is number one, the music is haunting and and involving and grand and majestic and terrifying and the moments of the the sea interludes standalone pieces are absolutely magical the moment when the chorus sings full out peter grimes uh, the shouting at this poor um misunderstood figure in a very very judgmental community um, it could be anywhere. Look at what's going on now in the world. Um, I, I find it, I, I think it still 
with, with many challenges within Britain's own output, I still think it's his most successful in, in, in the grandeur of it, in the grandeur of the vision. I totally agree. I, I, was, I could have chosen Midsummer Night's Dream, I could have t which I love, could have uh, chosen Turn of the Screw. Um, I, could have chose, I was even going to throw in um, the Billy Bud. I was even going to throw in Noyer's Flood, if, if that counted, because it's <laughs> sim simply the greatest piece of music ever written for children, and I don't think it'll ever be beaten. A wonderful work. And I get very emotional <laughs> at the end of that, that piece as well. But uh, no, I agree. I think Peter Grimes is, is absolutely a masterpiece. Another young man's work, uh, again, but with extraordinary maturity about the themes involved in, in the opera, very, very interestingly. And uh, I'd love to play. I've, I've played the played in the orchestra for the sea interludes many, many times. Never played the opera itself. I'd love to do that. It's such a rich score, isn't it? Um, a friend of mine, when I was at college, bought me the full score of it, and I've just spent the rest of my life just looking at it and trying to figure out how on earth he does some of those some of those things in, in, in that score. Very, very special. Um, Peter, where does Britain fe feature in, in in your life? You know, I, it's weird. I completely admire it. I mean, one of the greatest experiences of my life was the the old Tyrone Garthie production with John Vickers. I was just mm. devastated. I'm just, I still, I still, my skin already just now has the has goosebumps on it. It's, it's such an overwhelming experience. And of course, for Britain as a young person, just to say, no, we're going to make this happen and put all of that onto the stage. And like really all of it, as, as Fiona says, it's just the immensity of it is just incredible. It doesn't mm. say we're going to take this step by step. It says, no, we're going to do everything opera can do. Um, you know, uh, uh, for me, Britain has not been part of my life because my rule is always, if something's out there and doing well, nobody needs me to do it. And so, uh, and, and, and by the time I came along, Britain was doing just fine. So I've actually <laughs> never touched a Britain opera. Uh, uh, and, 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 but again, uh, Peter Grimes, I, I, you know, it remains uh, <laughs> one of those great breakthroughs that says opera exists. You know, at a, you know, and after a long period where opera existed so, you know, in England, in, in such painful terms, Britain just kind of reset the terms. And that, that's thrilling, just thrilling. Yeah. Um, Richard, Britain? Um, yeah, I mean, I, I, my choice, it's a hard one. Again, it would have been Billy Budd, but, but I mean, Peter Grimes is, is the defining work, is it? That's the starting point. That is, well, I say Fiona wants to avoid saying that. I, I did toy with the idea of throwing into the mix um, a, 30 minute opera by Vaughan Williams called Riders to the Sea, which very, very rarely done. It's even hard to find a recording, but it is the idea of it was no drama in it. You couldn't write drama, you couldn't write emotion in that period in British music. It's just, um, it's a sort of anatomy of grief um, set against this windswept, storm battered fishing community. Um, it's, just, it's just a family just entering tragedy, just going through the stages of a tragedy. Um, in 30 minutes, astonishing piece. But I, 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 I say, but I thought, well, well, Billy Bird, I mean, God. Um, you know, the, 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 the professionalism, it sounds terrible to say that, but there's something that, he, here's a man who knows how to make theatre in music. Um, it works, and, and that's the big problem with British opera really up to that point. Um, uh, like, like Peter says, and like Fiona says, he, he, suddenly there it was, he did it on a grand scale, he got it, he has a dramatic undertow, the pull, the inevitability, music is making drama for the first time there really in British music. and. Um, um, yeah, you can't ignore it, can you? And it's, it's, you know, and you can taste that salt. You can feel that sort of East Anglian overcast dampness in the score. Which, you know, that sense of place and atmosphere. Well, um, I, in fact, I should mention that those that are listening in the UK, if you go to the BBC iPlayer at the moment, you can see the uh, Grimes on the Beach production, uh, which was uh, done on the on the beach at Albra where ostensibly the opera is set under a different name. And it is a, it is a quite extraordinary experience. I, I, I wasn't there. I, I, I can't even remember why now I wasn't there because I really should have been there. But everyone I know who was there remembers it being extremely cold, <laughs> for one, but also quite an extraordinary experience. Were you there, Fiona? I, I was there. I, think, I, I don't think I could move because I had so many clothes on. <laughs> I, I, I mean, I literally had to keep on putting another layer, and I was still a frozen solid. And uh, th there's a bit at the beginning where they had a rather tremendous washing line. I can't quite remember what the washing line, but a real washing line. People, someone in the village, supposed to be hanging out there washing, and the washing was 
dancing all over the place because the wind was, the gale was tremendously high that night. But it, it was, um, they used, they used microphones, but, but it was, um, I think I'd probably prefer it in a theatre. <laughs> That's very yes. conventional of me, I know. But, uh, <laughs> I think it was written for a theatre, so I, I'm, Quite you know, right. I'll stick with that. I'm so pleased everybody, uh, well, not everyone chose it, but it's a wonderful one to have in the list, nevertheless. Uh, Peter, your third choice. Oh, my God. Let's, let's keep going uh, in yeah, chronologically, uh, like Fiona, but, you know, blow it out of the water, you know, the Messian San Francois de Cis. Um, mm -hmm. Just because, you know, what is, uh, when opera is this truly overwhelming experience, and you truly lose yourself in it, and it washes over you, you know, like the Pacific Ocean, just and the sort of immensity of, 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 of the spiritual release of opera of when that many people are working that hard to do something. And it creates this incredible energy in the world. And, 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 and Messian, of course, took on St. Francis, which is the main, you know, the topic of the 20th century, you know, the environment, the poor versus the rich, the, the incredible sense of regrounding ourselves after we're, we're creating these virtual societies. What does it mean to actually get real again? And, and, and have music that is that spacious, where it, across six hours, you have to calm down. You know, your, our, 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 our short attention span and our metabolism says, okay, get to the point. You know, suddenly says, <laughs> no, no, we're not gonna get to the point because that would not be an interesting point to get to. We need to get to a way deeper point and give yourself the time and space to actually think and feel much more deeply and to, just as you spend a day in nature, just contemplating and coming back to yourself, you know, what does it mean to recenter yourself? And the opera, the opera experience, of course, is not just about, you know, people stabbing each other in, in, in sacks, but it's truly this question of what are we as human beings? And that's an opera that opens out into the deepest human questions with this kind of magnificent generosity and heartfelt, heartfelt, um, uh, what can I say? It just soaks right into your pores. Mm -hmm. and, 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 and of course, the thrill of it, the sheer visceral thrill of the sound is beyond belief. Yeah. Fiona? See uh, I, I had, had written it down, I, and I have to say here, I don't know what Peter's next choice is going to be, but he won't know that when we did works the last 40 years, we all, I think, all chose um, Nixon in China. So uh, when, <laughs> when, possibly I speak for everybody, when I'm maybe not saying it this time. Um, so I, I, so Saint-Francois got, got a look in on that. I mean, I think he probably deserved a look in anyway. Um, I, I've re I think I've really only heard it twice. Mm. So I don't feel I know it well at all, but I feel I, I sense it. I, 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 I remember the feeling of it very vividly. Um, I'm glad you chose it. Yeah, this, this is your third choice, Peter, that, which uh, is, is, very, is rarely done compared to some of the other choices we've been, been throwing in. You, you, you obviously do gravitate towards the ones that, that are a little bit different. They are a little bit outside the... Well, to me, you know, nobody has to make a case for Puccini. Uh, whereas, you know, for me, I, I try to make a case for the things that you feel someone needs to make a case for them. And, mm. and so for me, that's always what's more interesting is to go for the thing that's underrepresented. And you always say, what is missing from this picture? And of course, that work is so hard, again, is so hard to do. I mean, it's an immense, you know, the budget is no longer available for 120 in the orchestra, 120 chorus, you know, this, this, it, it, the, sp the scope of it. But in the old days, that's what the Salzburg Festival could do, is you could really say, okay, it, you know, it doesn't happen every day. And just to, to say, for example, for me, it's a little depressing that people do Tristan too often now. For me, there are some things that you should just do every once in a while as a very special occasion and just appreciate that what something is great because it's rare. And, and it's a special moment when you finally are able to encounter it. Um, Richard, another choice from you? Um, well, um, it, it's, it's um, jumping, I say the chronology is all over the place now, but I, I wanted to, I didn't want us to get through this without talking about Janacek at all. 
and um, it's just it's just you know, where do you, how do you pick one of the Anacek? I I couldn't live without the cunning little Bix, and um, I'm always fascinated when people say I, I you know I always, I always come out of it feeling like you know tingling like I'm glad to be alive. And I just I, I'm always fascinated when other people saying it's so sad I can't believe you know and of course it is all those things. Um, um, also, I mean, you knew for Katya, these are operas you can't really leave the opera house without feeling moved, I think. I, the one I wanted to really bring up was the Macropolis case, yeah. um, which I think he wrote in 1926. And it's, again, it's, it's of all his undisputably great operas, I think it's the one that's done least, except perhaps possibly from the House of the Dead, which is also absolutely phenomenal. Um, but I, I love the Macropolis case because it's, um, again, it's, it, who, who'd have thought, it's set in 1926 in the present day, it begins with an argument in a solicitor's office with a couple of clerks talking about a legal case. Um, and it emerges in this way you simply don't expect, um, unless you've read the plays of Carol Capic a great deal, um, which I think most people in the English, English speaking world, it's fair, fairly safe to say, haven't terribly much. You don't know where it's going to go. And it evolves into this deeply weird, deeply strange science fiction story, sort of fantasy science fiction story, which is also a sort of meditation on transience, on what it means to be human, on the nature of life and death, um, with a lot of operatic incident thrown in along the way, set to this extraordinary, glowing, rapturous, bristling, um, shimmering score. Um, and I, I just find it fascinating. I mean, it's, it's I, I mean, we, we talked earlier about um, Merry Widow and, and Bluebeard at the start of the 20th century and Pelias, um, the sort of sense of time. And of course, in the last decade of Janacek's life, you know, the whole European order had collapsed in the previous decade and been remade into this sort of slightly provisional system that would lead to a Second World War. But you've got this sort of brief moment um, where, was, in the Macropolis case, you feel he's standing back. Um, I mean, he celebrated the change. He was all for revolution, all for things being different. But he's, there's this sense, this sort of glowing quality to score, which you sense he's kind of looking back over the world that's gone, um, standing on the on the edge of the new world and kind of looking forward to one but at the same time kind of saying well everything must pass there's this sort of sense of profundity and transience and deep beauty about it which I, I just think is intensely moving and again like Janacek I mean he's you know this is this is an opera made out of a science fiction um science fiction drama um you know he also wrote an opera about about a fox based on a newspaper cartoon strip um you know russian tr russian tragedies um you know there's nothing the chap can turn into something astonishing i mean he's what, what a fascinating unusual unpredictable mind and, and how, how vividly it comes to life i want to bring in um a harrison burt whistle opera i uh, i've seen all of his operas over the years and I just think he's a singular voice everywhere, but particularly in the opera house. And uh, Mask of Orpheus is the one that I, I would choose in my, in my five, because I, I mean, I, I could have chosen Gawain, but I was there at the premiere when it was too long and uh, it, it, it went on quite a long time. And, and of course, Harrison Burt was a new this, I think in the end, because he did a new version where it was much shorter. Um, but Mask of Orpheus knocked me uh, for six. It was absolutely fa fantastic to see that live. And Philip Langridge was the main singer in that production. And he's unforgettable. He's a most wonderful physical presence. Beautiful mover, uh, Langridge, uh, as well as a, a wonderful singer, of course. But the complexity of it all, I know that's a word that is always brought in with Bert Whistle. But it, it's the complexity of it, it's the complexity of the story and the way it's handled, but also then just that incredible music that just slowly go, kind of goes over you like a, like a like moving tar, but in a good way. I, I absolutely, it just absorbed the whole thing and just sit there with your jaw on the ground. I, I, if, if the Minotaur had been written in the 20th century, I'd have picked that too, but that, that's, uh, that's too recent. But uh, again, this... There, at the, every time I've seen one of his operas, at the end, you just think there really is nothing else like that. Genuinely, nothing else sounds like that. Um, and so I think Burt Whistle has to be in here. Peter, Harrison Burt Whistle. Oh, my God. <laughs> I, I, Orpheus is one of the things I, I wasn't around for. I, so I, I've always missed it. And I'm, I feel you know, not proud. I mean, I would love to be there. And Harry and I you know, talked about operas for years and years and years. And, and so I, I know a lot about the backstories of each of these pieces. And, uh, you know, I'm hardly the person to put them on stage because you don't need an American to show up to put Harry Bertwistle on stage. Uh, because, uh, but at the same time, I would just say, again, there's, there's somebody whose language, as you said, is so immensely powerful 
and doesn't necessarily communicate in human terms, but actually puts human beings in this cosmic, you know, mythic place, you know, and, and, and music that just actually deals with the mythic dimension of your life rather than the day to day of it, you know, and, and, and so that, that, that sense that you're, you know, these are Henry Moore sculptures in dialogue, you know, that, that, that's, that's really something that's really incredible. And again, a place that can happen only in opera, not in theater. Fiona, you, you wrote a fabulous book with, uh, with Harrison Birtwistle, uh, Conversations. Uh, did you choose a, a Birtwistle in your five? Um, well, I, I, I was sneakily hoping that you might, Tommy. Um, <laughs> and you did oblige me. Uh, I, I'd actually written down, I'd written down, actually, I think I wasn't, I wasn't getting the bit between my teeth here because I wrote down Mask of Orpheus, Oblique Stroke, Gawain. So, <laughs> um, it wasn't that I was hedging my bets. It was just that I think Mask of Orpheus was exactly rather like Peter Grimes, the turning point that you've just described, Tommy. Um, whereas Gawain, I, I, I just love the material that he used and the, the David Harsant rewriting of the um, medieval text of the Gawain and the Green Knight. Um, that you, you're talking about the t turning of the seasons that was the long section yes. that was, that is a sort of standalone wonderful piece of music. Yeah. But it, it is an extraordinary story and it was brilliantly staged. And John Tomlinson, quite a hero of many of us who've seen him in many, many different guises. Um, yeah, I'll go for Gawain. Very good. <laughs> Peter, we must move on. Your fourth choice. Oh, my God. You know, I'm sorry. I'm so unoriginal. Uh, but I just said, OK, let's mention Nixon in China. <laughs> <Yeah. Hey! laughs> Well, thank God you did. Let's <laughs> mention it. I, I think it's perfectly reasonable. So, so Peter Sellers, why do you pick uh, Nixon in China as one of your choices? Well, I just, it just said, okay, everything that's going on right now in our lives is actually already mythic, you know, and that you don't have to go back to ancient Greece to find mythology and to see the way mythology is operating. And opera, of course, is works on that mythical plane. But also, you know, with this, uh, you know, as, as Richard said, you know, wh what is the place of humor exactly in some of the most, you know, devastating, you know, situations? And of course, um, you know, the, 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 the reaching out to China and uh, China is the future of the West and the West is the future of China. And, you know, what is the point of that dialogue for an, uh, for an opera to handle that, that material? First of all, I would just say, you know, John's music combined with Alice Goodman's incredible text. I've been staging Nixon in China for more than like 30 years. And every time we come to it, we do a new staging because the, the subject matter keeps changing. We keep learning more about China. We keep learning more about ourselves, the backstories of all those characters. Suddenly, totally new details emerge. And it's an opera that you know, is about you know, 1972, but in fact, is a, you know we have to change every week of our lives right now and that's kind of an astonishing thing as well as the fact that it's just theatrically you know so sensational and 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 has this this sense of you know on stage it's just the fizz and the the kind of irresistible electricity of it uh you know is a blast i, I i'm so pleased you you picked it because it, as fiona mentioned we we did talk about it in our uh, podcast about works from the from since 1980 and so we we won't we won't uh, spend too much time on it now but what i will say is that for me hearing hearing it for the first time in the 80s and also it's sort of side piece the german dances for me as a as a young composer it completely changed the way i looked at music the way i approached music because it it just spoke to me immediately i thought oh this is the music for me and I very luckily uh, in my career was able to tell John Adams this a couple of times in interviews, but it was, it really was genuinely one of those moments. I heard the music on Radio 3 and everything changed from that moment on because I could see another way and I was really rather attracted to it and it sent me on that way. And then to discover the opera and to see it, and it's, it, as you say, it's such a great dramatic piece. And, with, and of course, with a contemporary subject. I think that was the other really important thing for me 
it was an opera about something that I knew about. Um, I didn't really remember it exactly, but um, I knew about it and, uh, and it felt fresh and, and, and recent. And I think that that was the other thing that really, really spoke to me. But we, we talked about Nixon Child a lot. So uh, May I just add uh, one yes. little, just I want to mention one little thing, because, you know, people say, oh, documentary opera, docu opera mm. or CNN opera. And you just want to say, excuse me, <laughs> you know, quite the opposite, you know, is that what's missing in most of the way our own news of our own lives is presented to us is the emotional temperature. You know, our lives are emptied of emotion by the time they show up on the evening news. And, and so for me, the delicate melancholy, you know, all of these just delicate, delicate temperatures that John Adams touches with that music are what is so amazing. And you, we don't get those temperatures in most of the news, in most of the way our own histories are being presented to us. And also, uh, it's a modern opera with, with some really memorable tunes in it. I mean, whenever anyone ever mentions the news aria, I'm off. I, I'm singing that for the rest of the night. <laughs> John knows his way around an earworm. <laughs> he certainly, he cer he certainly yes. does. <laughs> well, look, I don't, want, I don't want us to run out of time. So let's go straight to your last choice, Peter, and then we'll go around and uh, see, uh, figure out the ones we've missed out. We're just on the cusp. We're just, you know, they, we're saying goodbye to the 20th century with L'Amour de Loire of Caio Sariajo, of course, which is just the, you know, the beginning in so many ways of, you know, opening up uh, these bridging of worlds that opera achieves, you know, and, and this, I mean, my loose libretto, which, you know, reaches across, you know, the, a forbidden space that still is a forbidden space in contemporary history. And, and meanwhile, Caio Sariajo opening opera into this other type of time and space, this other, you know, delicate, fine, fine contemplation and also surges of emotion that, you know, are moving through the weather, are moving through the ocean, are moving, but moving in this way that is so interiorized that we begin to actually find a space again that, as, as Richard said earlier, that, you know, we've been looking for. We, you know, and, and you go to opera not to just be, have stuff crammed into you. That's what's happening in most of our media lives. But you go to opera actually to open yourself and to create a spaciousness that you don't ordinarily feel. And there it is. I think it's, I think it's fascinating that there's been a sort of new surge, I think, of really interesting operas from, from composers work, working now. I, uh, maybe you'd agree with this. Fiona, I mean, I, if again, if it had been written in the 20th century, I probably would have uh, chosen George Benjamin's uh, mm. Written on Skin, which has been a real hit. Has it been a real proper, bona fide uh, contemporary music opera hit, hasn't it, around the world? Um, and Sariah, who seems to be, uh, again, one of, those, one of those composers that's really exploring the medium again. Fiona. Uh, I, was, I was going to be rather pedantic and say, I, I thought it was actually premiered in 2000, so I didn't, I didn't venture there, but I think it had some pre-performance in... <laughs> we were working on it. <laughs> 1999, so... Um, uh, yeah, that's why I said, it's just on the, we're just on the cusp. Yes, I think cusp is very much the word, um, but uh, it's a stunning piece. Hang on, some people argue, do they not, that the, the 21st century doesn't start until... Um, the what is it the first of That's January true. anyway so I wasn't being argumentative I was just uh, sort yeah. of thinking <laughs> <laughs> okay well we, we just got a couple of minutes left so which are the major ones we've left out I mean has any no one's mentioned Votsek yet or Lulu or yeah. Lulu or uh, Rake's Progress South Operas Salome Electra Rosen Cavalier Rosen, Rosen Cavalier I wouldn't have put but I know a lot of people. I, 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 I was going to put Rosen Cavalier at one point, but um, uh, I, I, okay. I didn't. Oh, at one point. Right. Okay. I'd like to hear it for King Priam and the Knock Garden. Oh. Oh. Thank you. Michael Tippett, yeah. Yes. And, um, thank, you. thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Fiona. Mm -hmm. well, my, my, and, my, my fifth choice was going to be um, the icebreak, actually. Oh. Yeah. Yeah. There you go. For, for reasons? Just it's um, what it, it, it's, it's. I mean, it's sort of what was premiered. It's been only been produced twice, as far as I can tell. Um, the premiere production of the seventies, misunderstood, you know, insulted, laughed at. What's he on about? What a mess! You know, he's trying to be cool, deeply embarrassing. You know, granddad, of, embarrassing granddad of British music, sort of thing. Then this recent Graham Vic production, which I attended in Birmingham um, about three or four years ago now, which was 
devastating, absolutely devastating. It's all there in that opera. It's the whole, all, all, all the anxiety, the stress, the confusion of contemporary life. You have generations at war, you have classes at war, you have races just clashing with each other on the streets, all coming together, all with it, tippet seeing the humanity on every side, trying to bring together all these different musical languages, clashing, mixing, um, touching you and, and gradually adding up to something bigger, something it just felt so incredibly real, so urgent, so now in the 21st century, um, in a way that it doesn't seem to have done when it first came around in the 1970s. And I think that's fascinating. Perhaps the piece genuinely can be ahead of its time. And, you know, all the, the, the sort of the complexity and the sort of different layers, of the, the sort of the way, the way all those voices he brought them together in that piece. Um, I mean, perhaps, perhaps we're only starting to really understand what he's doing there, but you know, wow, what a piece. And I've never felt quite so not backwards by a theatrical experience. I say it's a promenade production in a derelict warehouse in Birmingham with a community chorus um, and a professional cast and an orchestra just sort of stuck in the middle, just heroically keeping it together somehow. Um, and um, it was raw and it was, it was terrifying and it was thrilling and it was moving and it's everything that, you know, opera can be and can do, I think. I'm just going to uh, mention very quickly uh, Philip Glass as well, uh, Akhenaten, which again, another one of those wonderful experiences, saw it when it first came to London in the 80s and saw it again and again. It's been a big hit in, uh, in, in London um, more recently with revivals of that of, of, of a production. And uh, I could listen to that all day. And I love Einstein on the Beach for all sorts of different reasons, but I just adore that piece because again, there really is nothing else quite like it. Um, I think we should we need to wrap up now. But uh, Peter, please, will you tell us what you're up to at the moment? You, I, I gather you are working on something sort of online. <laughs> yes, I am. I am. I mean, that that'll be that'll be wild. It's a it's a first century Buddhist sutra called the Vimalakirti Sutra, which uh, the primary character is ill. And so in this period of the virus, uh, uh, the idea of sickness as a teacher and as a spiritual path is really quite amazing. And so we will, we will stream that. It won't happen in any theater and it will really happen in worldwide streaming and that will come in the early autumn. Uh, so I'm rehearsing that every day right now. Uh, and, and it's with performers on three continents and they're all being Zoomed together. Uh, so it's it, it, we're rehearsing on Zoom right now, and it's quite an amazing experience. Uh, very, very powerful, and something that belongs in cyberspace rather than in a theater, uh, because it's that Buddhist universe where, with a single thought, the human body can be appear simultaneously in multiple Buddha universes. So it, it actually is a piece made for cyberspace, uh, and and that's the that's the hope. And I, I would just really emphasize that. For me, this smaller scale is so exciting. And if we, we want to include, you know, the, the Monquet theater of the 20th, 20th century, the, the, the little Mahagoni, you know, uh, uh, this way of you can make a little opera with, again, a handful of people, 45 minutes long, but concentrated and to the point. And, and, and that kind of experience is what people are looking for a lot at this moment. Not something that's about, you know, that's lasting 10 hours, but something that, in fact, with a light touch and an immediacy, uh, is is exactly to the point, uh, or I'm thinking of, you know, uh, Claude Vivier's Copernicus. You know, these seven singers, seven instruments. You know, uh, let's let's create something that has this sense of um, grassroots, and that we're, we're like we have to rebuild the whole society anyway from the grassroots. We really, it's not about the large institutions. We need to get integrity at the small scale. And uh, with, uh, you know, Fiona, I'm always looking to stage Hildegard, of course. I mean, uh, and, 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 and the, the <laughs> sense of, I, I, you know, you will see uh, Ordo Virtutum uh, eventually. You know, I've been staging Orlando de Lasso. I've been staging these things which are, you can get, as you said, Richard, a small community together. And, you know, 21 singers, but it, it creates this, it's a, it is the sound of a community working together, which is what we need in this world at this moment, really profoundly. And so, so I think a lot of younger composers are moving in this direction very excitingly. And I would just mention Kaya Sariajo's, you know, last opera before the one that's going on now in X is, is called um, Only the Sound Remains which is probably the correct title after the virus. Uh, and, but, but just to say it's done again with seven instruments, two singers and one dancer. 
and this sense that opera actually does fit the budget and actually can move you know across communities in lots of different situations and and find this this vibrant gathering point for people let's let's hope for that and and again touch wood and touch monteverdi <laughs> peter thank you very much as always it's it's fascinating to know what you're going to be coming up with next um, always creative and always wonderful to, to talk to as well. Thank you so much for joining us on Classical Top 5. We really appreciate your time. I know. What an amazing group of people. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> well, thank you. And so, so good to see you. And uh, thank you, everyone, for listening. Thanks for your company. And we'll uh, see you next week. <laughs>